Let's move on to the next talk today uh, by Professor Joseph Samuel. Uh, it's called Theory, Light, and Matter at RRI, A Personal Perspective. Uh, just briefly, um, Professor Joseph Samuel really needs no introduction to many of us, and I have to say it's a delight to have him here with us today. Um, I can only describe him as a polymath. He has worked on a range of research topics from optics to geometric phase, classical mechanics, classical and quantum gravity, and mathematical physics. His 1988 work on the Berry phase with Professor Bhandari is a very important legacy for RRI. It's one of these very highly cited papers. He's also contributed seminal research uh, to loop quantum gravity approach in its early days, uh, which is the avatar of Sam that I first knew. Um, since then, I've noticed that he has many different avatars. Uh, he's incredibly broad, and he has a very open attitude. Uh, and I think he's uh, given RRI a legacy of truly interdisciplinary science uh, with the idea that knowledge knows no boundaries. A brief bio, he did his integrated masters in physics from IIT Kanpur and his PhD in physics from ISC, during which he joined RRI from 1982 till uh, 2020. Since then, he's been a Simons visiting professor at the ICTS. He also visited Syracuse University in the middle of all of uh, when he was at RRI and worked with uh, Professor Ashtikar, Smolin, and Rovelli, who are you know, the big names in loop quantum gravity. He works most generally on classical mechanics, optics, general relativity, geometric phase and quantum mechanics, and soft condensed matter, as well as the popularization of science. So uh, without further ado, Sam, please thank you. So let me start by thanking Tarun for this invitation to talk in this forum. I'm very happy to be here and to share some of my excitement with all of you. I've had a glorious time at RRI. It's been a long journey and I've really enjoyed every bit of it. So I'd like to start by just talking about the logo a little bit. This thing which you see here is the logo of the Platinum Jubilee. Probably not all of you have uh, well grasped the meaning of, uh, of the logo. So I'll give you a brief explanation. This is supposed to represent a topological idea called the eversion of the sphere. Yeah, the eversion of the sphere. I'm not sure if you've heard the word eversion before. It's different from aversion. Basically, a sphere and its inversion are homotopically the same, which is to say I can continuously deform one to the other. So I can take a sphere and turn it inside out. So this is also supposed to represent the fact that one can reinvent oneself periodically. You start out with a sphere and you turn yourself inside out. So this institute is now 75 years old. And if it can maintain the same intellectual curiosity in the 75th year as it did on the 16th, then, well, eversion is the key. Keep reinventing yourself. Now let me get on with the talk. I'll start with the plan of the talk, which has uh, the prehistory first. And then the phase which uh, Rajaram talked about, I will just talk about it very briefly. And then go over the work in light and matter physics and theoretical physics. And finally, I'll express some opinions on theory and experiments and conclude. It's not going to be as scientific as the last talk. There's less scientific substance. But I thought this was a popular talk. And probably it's better to give a few general ideas rather than, uh, yeah, rather than detailed scientific uh, insights. So the prehistory of this institute goes back to the founder, C.V. Raman. C.V. Raman, who was a natural philosopher in the tradition of Lord Rayleigh, his inquiries often started from direct observations through his senses. And since the most important senses we have are the eyes and the ears, a lot of his work concentrated on light and sound from the Raman effect, which is of course an effect in light, to the sound of a veena or a tabla. All these observations started with, all these scientific inquiries started with direct observation. 
The questions he addressed were formulated in natural language, and so also were his answers and his scientific papers. Now, this belongs in the great tradition of science, Rayleigh, whom Raman very much admired, Darwin, Benjamin Franklin, all these people used natural language with clarity and precision, and they were able to think very hard and deep by just using natural language. I'd like to now make a detour, and some of this overlaps with Rajaram's talk. At some point, Raman handed his uh, well, handed Pancharatnam a crystal, which is iolite, which is supposed to have some mystical properties, as I learned today, and asked him to understand its optical properties. Now, iolite is an absorbing crystal and sensitive to the polarization of light. While thinking about this problem, Pancharatnam started thinking about the interference of polarized light. So the questions he asked were the following. When are two beams of polarized light in phase with each other? In phase translates to being in step with each other, like an army marching, all the soldiers are in step. And the answer he came up with is when the resultant intensity is a maximum. Pursuing this idea, he insisted on checking the following, the following idea. One, that the beam A is in phase with itself. So I denote that by a symbol A twiddle A, which is to say A is in phase with itself. The next question is, if A is in phase with B, then B is in phase with A, or rather that's a statement, is it true or not? So does A twiddle B imply B twiddle A? And pursuing this further, if A is in phase with B, and B is in phase with C, is A in phase with C? And the answer to his surprise was no. The phase difference between A and C, given these conditions, is that it is given by half the solid angle subtended on the Poincaré sphere. The Poincaré sphere being a very geometric way of representing the polarization states of light. Now, Pancharatham's inquiry was firmly rooted in experiment and at the same time, deeply rooted in mathematics. Each of the statements above, which I've talked about, can be translated into a real experiment. And it can also be considered pure mathematics. Mathematically, what he was checking was the notion of an equivalence relation. In mathematics, given the set and a relation between its elements, written A twiddle B, we ask, is it reflexive? Is it symmetric? And is it transitive? What he found was that the first two were two true, and the third was false. And the third one being false suddenly puts us in a different category entirely. It's not, whenever you have an equivalence relation, the state split up, the, the set splits up into equivalence classes. And in this case, it does not. What it does is to bring us into the realm of curvature, and this is exactly the curvature of the Poincaré sphere. You can see now that by asking questions in natural language, and then asking them precisely and experimentally, he was naturally led to some very mathematical uh, consequences. The change from natural language to mathematical language had great consequences. The ideas were applicable far beyond the original context. They, were at, they anticipated Berry's phase in quantum mechanics, which is now being used all over the place to understand topological condensed matter. And this is an example of how theoretical and mathematical thinking emerges naturally from experimental physics. Now, I'm saying all this with a purpose. I'd like to well, put across the, the idea that theoretical physics properly belongs in this institute, although it's primarily an experimental institute. So in the next phase after Raman passed away in 1970, there were just two groups in the institute. They were the liquid crystal group, which you heard about just now from Professor Madhusudna, and the radio astronomy group, or rather, well, I learned today that it is called the cosmic physics group, but let's not believe that. There was also chemistry to generate the molecules that were studied in the liquid crystal group, electronics to which serviced both the radio astronomy and the liquid crystals, and instrumentation. A memorable event from this time, which I unfortunately did not attend, is the summer school of 1976. 
Some of my friends attended it and were raving about it. And they told me that, well, Nandikar, Rajaram, Radhakrishnan, and Srini, they were all mentors in this school. And some very conceptual questions were discussed in the school. The relation between Einstein's elevator, accelerated charges, and radiation is actually a very interesting question, having conceptual and deep foundations. At, I mean, it's at the foundations of physics. And if you pursue it enough, I think you'll find something really uh, you know, related to many other branches of physics. It inspired many young people to take to astronomy and physics. Rajaram told me today, that, I mean, mentioned today that there was also a school in 1977. But uh, yeah, this is the 76 school is the one I'm talking about. So then in the next phase, the liquid crystals were, uh, well, headed by Professor Chandrasekhar, as you heard. And they studied the anisotropic optical properties of liquid crystals. Polarization was a big deal in the whole venture. They used to use cross polaroids to observe the optical properties. And on the radio astronomy side, which was led by V. Radhakrishnan, the design of telescopes involves electronics, electromagnetic waves, polarization, and also pulsar radiation, which they study in astrophysics, is polarized. And pulsar radiation, the polarization of pulsar radiation is the area in which Rad made his bones as a young man in Australia. Optics interest was firmly entrenched in both the liquid crystal lab and the astrophysics group. And this is a tradition going back to Raman Pancharatnam. And we heard from Madhusudana also, there were many people interested in optics in the liquid crystal group. And most of these people live and breathe the point sphere. That's their natural habitat. So Ranganath, and incidentally, I should also mention that Ranganath had a bit of the natural philosopher in him. He's, he was interested in many different things. One day I learned from him that there's a sea creature, a very primitive sea creature, which uses the pinhole camera for an eye instead of using a lens like most of the evolved creatures. All these are interesting optical facts. And this actually, this interest of his goes back to perhaps his advisor and beyond. And these are all people in the liquid crystal lab. Suresh, who's here, Madhusna, who just spoke to you. And two RNs that, that is, uh, well, all these people were opticians. Rajaram Nityananda, Ramesh Narayan, and Avinash Deshpande. I mean, by being a radio astronomer, you learn a lot of electromagnetic theory. And Ramseshan and Rajendra Bandari in Astro. So you can see that there was a lot of optics around. In astrophysics, the study was the stu well, people studied pulsars, neutron stars, supernovae, and black holes, accretion disks, and these are extreme conditions where there are strong gravitational fields. This led naturally to the field of relativistic astrophysics. In fact, this field was kicked off in the 1960s by the Texas Symposium in Astrophysics when it was suddenly realized with the advent of radio astronomy that there was really powerful energetic sources of in, in the sky, in galaxies. These sources, of course, have very strong gravitational field. And it naturally led to general relativity being a part of astrophysics. And in fact, I think the suggestion that it should be a part of the astrophysics group of this institute came from Professor Chandrasekhar in Chicago. The practitioners of the subject were, well, Vishu, Bala, and Rajaram. And on the other side, the people who were doing instrumentation and image processing, they were also extracting theoretical problems from astrophysics. And here's the long list of people who I've already mentioned, I think, except that Vivekanand is here, and uh, Shukri, and uh, well, RN appears twice here, that's an oversight. Uh, yeah, and uh, Anthramaya, who unfortunately is no longer with us, and Dwarkanath, and Uday Shankar. Both theoretical physics and light and matter physics emerged as a natural outgrowth of the interests of people at RRI. Now, this was an organic growth, just as a tree puts out shoots that grow into branches. At this stage, the institute was now comprised of four groups. What used to be liquid crystals morphed into soft matter physics, which is a slightly broader term than liquid crystals. 
liquid crystals as you heard from madhusudana deals with well the orientational disorder and translate well order in disorder and translational order in disorder so there's a lot of entropy involved there soft matter physics is a broader term which deals with all entropy dominated systems which includes liquids gases and also spin glasses and many other systems granular materials and a lot of biological physics as well of course astrophysics continued in its old form but the two new groups that were formed were the light and matter physics group and theoretical physics i must say that this is a very apt acronym the light and matter physics and i'm sure someone spent a whole sleepless night thinking of a acronym that will actually mean something when you write it out so here's a very brief overview of the the physics in the lamp group which is what we call it now so in this part what i've done is to use the archive here around the time that i left this institute we were involved in a process of making an archive that is collecting the work of the different groups and putting them together in some coherent form it was done by a committee so that it would be fair and and representational so that it included the work of all the people who are who are here and i'm going to follow this tradition here and in this whole part of the talk no names will be mentioned it will be obvious to the people who did the work whether they what their work is well what work is represented here so this work has to do with imaging in turbid media you have out here the real image which you can see very plainly on the screen but when you look at it through a turbid medium which is over here you see something black you don't see an image at all and it's important in many applications to be able to see through fog in fact seeing through the fog of confusion in theoretical in, in physics itself is one of the obstacles to progress in the subject so if you want to navigate in murky water and submarine say or if you want to you know have uh, medical imaging you need to be able to see through turbid media and they developed a technique by realizing that the photons that came straight from the image to you do carry information but those that wander around and don't come to you and come to you by a long path do not carry information and there are also in between photons called the snake photons which come to you by an almost straight path these the first the straight photons and the snake photons carry motion of the information the problem is to eliminate the rest of the stuff that's the stuff that's not carrying information and they did that by modulating the polarization with a specific frequency and detecting the same frequency and you can see here that what was a mess in b and c is clearly visible as moving images from d to h now this has to do with laser cooling of atoms the lamp group also morphed from being a mainly an optics group to be a group which studies matter as well as radio as uh, light and here you see the cooling of atoms using a laser what you do is you address a particular line in an atom spectrum and you slightly detune it so that when a photon is absorbed it the atom loses momentum and cools thereby later on of course the atom emits that photon spontaneously in some direction and since the direction is unknown the entropy is taken out of the system and you that results in cooling this is the quart from the quantum interactions lab and here one one is dealing with ions trapped uh, trapped in an ion trap and you can the, the, all all this is very relevant for state of the art uh, with studies on uh, ionic ion strapped atoms for example if you have uh, collisions with atoms you can cool atoms uh, you, you can cool the ions using the cooling of atoms which i talked about earlier so this is also some more of the same kind of uh, the, the, the laser cooling and trapping has become an important part of in, um, of uh, research in the lamp group here now this is an experiment called the triple slit experiment and this was actually motivated by 
some work due to Rafael Sorkin, who is a visiting professor, adjunct professor at this institute. He's normally based at Syracuse University. And he has wide interests that range from quantum gravity to, well, Brownian, quantum Brownian motion. And both these interests have been reflected at this institute. So this is actually supposed to be part of a, a measurement of the Sorkin parameter, which is the larger scheme of things. He was suggesting that there could be interferences in quantum mechanics, which go beyond the two-slit experiment, and which are revealed only by a three-slit experiment. So this work was related to the Sorkin parameter. Another part of the Institute's LAMP activity is secure communication. That's very important for business as well as well, for military applications. And if you have to send a message, you're always suspicious that the enemy might get hold of it, either a hacker somewhere trying to steal your credit card information or an adversary in a war, like the one that's currently going on in Ukraine. So most cryptographic protocols which are in use rely on mathematical difficulty, whereas quantum physics affords new possibilities for encryption, stemming from physical laws rather than mathematical complexity. And they are far more secure because one day you might find some smart guy coming up with a way to crack the mathematical diff mathematically difficult problem of factorizing prime numbers, which is one of the ways in which one encrypts uh, uh, messages. Now, some of the work there deals with nonlinear optics, which is, happen which is what happens when you have intense beams of light. When you have powerful beams, just like you, as you might have seen in James Bond movies, it can actually vaporize the material. And the study of intense beams of light is one, one of the things that's going on here. And you can use it in two modes. You can have what they call soft ablation, where you just mark the surface and tailor the surface to your needs. Or you actually uh, set up plasma waves in the, surf you set up surface plasma waves, as you can see in in this slide. Now this is another kind of work that is related to electromagnetically induced transparency. Now if an atom absorbs resonant light, you would not expect to see it on coming out on the other side because it gets absorbed by the atom. But it's possible in a three-level system to arrange matters so that the absorption is destroyed by destructive interference between two different channels. And that's called electromagnetically induced transparency. And when you have uh, EIT, you can actually have uh, transmission of light through the sample, even though it should have been absorbed. And this is a quantum effect, which is being studied in one of the labs here. Now coming to the theoretical physics, I started out by talking about Pancharatnam's work on optics. It turns out that optics and quantum mechanics have very similar mathematical structures. As a result of this, the same ideas that Pancharatnam had and which were later rediscovered by Berry can also be used to understand parts of quantum mechanics, in particular the, the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics. And this resulted in numerous applications and one of them is that geometric phases are being used to understand topological matter, the properties of matter at very low temperatures in condensed matter samples. Some of the methods that we used in image reconstruction here and maximum entropy were used in the Event Horizon Telescope. It went into the processing of the data. This is a situation where there's hardly any data and you have to try to construct an image. That's exactly the problem that was tackled in RRI in the early, in the post-Raman early days phase. And some of the work, the papers that produced this image actually referred to the work from RRI. Now this is a picture of an accretion disk surrounding a black hole and emitting a radio jet. I note with some pride that the figure was drawn by my daughter. So black holes secrete matter from neighboring stars. Since the infalling matter has angular momentum, it orbits around the black hole before falling in. 
The friction between neighboring orbits generates heat and huge amounts of gravitational energy to be emitted as X-rays and other forms of gravitational electromagnetic radiation. Work at RRI studied aspects of this and li put limits on the energy output. These limits are similar to Eddington limits, which were proposed by Eddington, where the outgoing radiation keeps further matter from falling in. And uh, I should also mention that the gravitational parts of this, uh, well, of the gravity will be covered in more detail in the next talk. And here's an artist's impression of a neutron star. Here's an, it is one of the objects that was, uh, well, it's too, uh, it, it would never have been thought of, but apparently the story is that about within a day or so after the neutron was discovered, Lev Davidovich Landau suggested that there could be neutron stars and they were discovered only about 30 years later. As, so pulsars are supposed to be spinning neutron stars and this is a picture of a pulsar. So classical GR was explored in RRI, existence of ultra compact neutron stars and higher dimensional black holes and quasi normal loads of black holes in other theories of gravity have also been explored. And there is this very interesting effect called gravitational lensing. If you, if a light ray passes by a black hole or a strong gravitational field or even the sun, it is slightly deflected. And this was one of the early predictions of general relativity that was tested in 1919. So work here has to do with understanding gravitational lensing from various points of view. There was also a formulation of uh, Fermat's principle in curved space-time and wavefronts were applied to modeling gravitational lenses. There's also a st some study of caustics which form when you look in a teacup and you can see very sharp lines in a teacup. They're all visible in this system just as they are in a teacup. So quantum gravity is one of the most fascinating and difficult problems in quantum gravity. Finding a consistent theory of quantum mechanics and gravity is in fact the holy grail of theoretical physics today. It's actually some kind of a union between the very small, which is quantum, and the very large, which is gravity. So this institute has research in two approaches to the quantum, to the problem of quantum gravity, loop quantum gravity and causal sets. And Professor Sorkin, whom I mentioned earlier, is a champion of the causal set approach. And Ashtekar has been the originator of the loop quantum gravity approach. There is also another, well, there is a much larger body of people who work in string theory, who believe that that is the right way. These are all alternate, uh, well, uh, different approaches to the same problem. And I think there's no real meeting of, right now we don't know which is the right way to go. No, I think no one does. But it is an imp uh, important problem and it's probably the most fundamental problem facing theoretical physics today. So this has to do with gravitational radiation which was discovered in uh, co the colliding black holes and observed in the LIGO telescope. The gravitational wave passes the telescope, I mean, passes the interferometer and it shrinks one dimension and expands the next. And the result of which you get a fringe shift which can be measured is very small and it has been measured by a superhuman effort, a very large global effort and RRI has played a key role here. And one of those key roles was working out the predicted waveforms. And this is another example of soft matter, overlap between the theoretical physics and soft matter physics. And some of this was actually done as an experiment. Vibrated brains are telling you about granular matter. And this has to do with out of equilibrium systems, granular material, and scaled up versions of Brownian motion. Now this is being studied both theoretically and experimentally at RRI. There's some more overlap with the soft condensed matter group. So surface tension plays an important part in small systems like dewdrops 
and determines their shapes. And I mentioned before that entropy dominated systems are called soft matter systems. So in all these systems you have lots of thermal vibrations as opposed to hard matter systems where you have essentially quantum fluctuations. So one example is the theoretical study of elastic properties of DNA. That is a soft matter problem. The molecule that contains the genetic code. And the elasticity of DNA is entropy dominated. I'll skip over this. This has to do with biological physics and where how soft matter is applied there. I'd like to now say a few words about theory and experiment. And this was my objective in starting out this talk. This was my objective in starting out this talk by saying that, uh, well, actually theory has been firmly rooted in this institute for a long time, ever since Pancharatnam, in fact. So RRI is primarily an experimental institute. And what is the place of theory here? Let me start by just noticing that there's no such thing as pure experiment. You saw in the last talk, that experimentalists are theorists as well. They try to understand what they do. You never have something which is purely experiment unre unrelated to theory. Experimenters try to understand the results of their experiments. They formulate hypotheses and design experiments to test these. In this early part of the development of this, of any subject, natural language is the most useful tool. You start asking questions in ordinary prose. And then you try to answer them by doing your experiments. As the subject develops and the qualitative physics is understood, one feels the need for a more precise language. And this is provided by mathematics. This is precisely what happened in Pachinathan's work in optics. It started out with a very uh, observation dominated inquiry and then slowly turned into a mathematical and theoretical question. This work of Pancharatnam's is a very early example of emergent gauge fields and now they are finding them all over the place including in condensed matter theory, in hard condensed matter. When our understanding is formulated in mathematical language, one begins to see connections that we would otherwise miss between different fields of physics. For example, we heard in the last talk, there's a connection between superconductivity and liquid resistance. This was worked by Dijen. There's a connection between the Higgs mechanism in particle physics and superconductivity. There's an analogy between rotation and magnetic fields, which has also been studied in this institute. This is what leads to theoretical physics. When you start put, getting to more and more levels of abstraction, what you find is that natural language is not precise enough and you are you reach for the more precise language of mathematics. What is at play here is the power of abstraction. It does not matter whether you count cabbages or kings. The same number system works. Abstraction is the art of leaving things out. It lets you see the essence of a problem and see what is common between different problems. Of course, mathematics has its pitfalls too. Given some basic assumptions, it produces a rigorous and precise structure but this structure may be quite irrelevant to the real world. The mathematical model is only as good as its basic assumptions. It is inappropriate to describe a nebulous and ill-formed physical idea in mathematical terms. It needed Faraday to get the right physical ideas before Maxwell could put them in a mathematical form. Now, I'd like to conclude with some general remarks about the way in which RRI is to function. Over the years, the TP group has had interaction with all the other groups at RRI. It has enriched them and also been enriched by them. There were some factors which aided this interaction. I would like to mention two of them, the architecture of this institute and the journal club. The institute has lounges where one can hang around and drink coffee without intruding, intruding on other people's space and time. This leads to greater social interaction, but sometimes it does not stop with exchange of pleasantries or gossip. It leads to scientific interaction and often leaves everyone the wiser. That was an important factor which I felt during my stay here. 
The RRI Journal Club was started in 1982, just before I joined the, the institute. It has continued to this day. There were some specific and sensible rules which governed it. In many places, the Journal Club is essentially converted into a seminar. In the RRI Journal Club, you could not talk about your own work. You picked a paper slightly outside your field and explained it to the audience. This led to numerous interactions and scientific inquiries. I'd perhaps also like to just go back to some parts which I had skipped over, thinking that I had only five minutes. Yeah. So this has to do with uh, Anderson localization and the, the comparison between the, the, the transport of heat in disordered systems. And this is polymer physics. The, the elasticity of polymers is largely entropic in nature. This includes the DNA molecule. And uh, such things were investigated in the theory lab. And this has got, of course, lots of uh, experimental um, confirmation as well. And active particles is an area which is now taken off. It has to do with systems which have their own energy source, like living systems. This is related to biological physics as well. And apart from this, I also, re I mean, I'd also like to mention that uh, in the lamp group, there have been some developments related to Rydberg atoms, which are very large atoms. What they have done is to produce atoms which are in the principal number 125 state. That's an extremely large atom, where the electron is very distant from the nucleus in comparison to the ordinary atom. Not angstroms, but microns in size. And this is a host of other applications, including quantum computation, and we look forward to more of those in the future. So before closing, I'd like to mention the past directors who have all left their stamp on the place. Rad, Kumar, and Ravi. I don't use professor before their names because we are quite informal in RRI. There were also guiding lights like Dhawan, Ram Seshin, and MGK Menon, whose support saw us through many difficult times. Finally, I wish Tarun all the best for the future. Thank you for your attention.